Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas along with Paul Farkas here. And welcome to another CooperVision best practice video. CooperVision's best practices program celebrates practices that are elevating the industry through excellence in patient care or business development and community support. Um, so the way it works is that practices are nominated and you can nominate yourself. You can uh, go to the website, icarebestpractices.com. Oh. <clears throat> and basically there's a questionnaire that you fill out to describe your practice. Um, and then the application is put in front of judges. Now these aren't just random people. Um, the judges are prior best practice honorees. Right. right, so these, exactly. these are your peers, these are ODs, these are people out in the community, um, and they'll look at your application, and then industry experts will also look at your application, and from this gigantic pool of applications, um, these 10 best practices are picked every year. Uh, right. And so what happens is when you're picked, um, you get to go to a summit where you interact with people, uh, other people who have the best practices, uh, learn from them and also give tips of your own as well. And throughout the year as well, you interact uh, at various events with the folks who, who are part of the best practices. And the really cool part about this is that we get to interview these practices and, and we get- meet, meet some wonderful get, people. We get to meet people and more, most importantly, they give advice. And so they can share their advice with everyone here. Right. Um, and today in particular, we're speaking about co-management. So a topic near and dear to your heart from the beginning oh, sure. of your practice. Um, and we have two experts on the subject with us today. So let me introduce them to everyone. Uh, we have Dr. Ben, Benjamin Asman uh, from Asman Eye Care Specialists in Timonium, Maryland. Dr. Asman is the medical director at the Dry Eye Center of Maryland, the Macular Degeneration Prevention Center at Asman Eye Care Specialists, and the co-director of Contact Lens Specialty Services. Um, he's a SUNY grad, and he currently specializes in the treatment and management of dry eye, contact lenses, and in promoting awareness, prevention, early diagnosis, and early intervention of macular degeneration. Wow. So he's got- Busy guy. He is, and he, <laughs> <laughs> he has experience in both private practice and in hospital settings, and we're gonna learn a lot more today about his practice in particular yep. uh, and how he handles co-management. And along with Ben, uh, we have Dr. Katie Greiner of Northeast Ohio Eye Surgeons, located in Kent, Ohio, Stowe, Ohio, and Akron, Ohio, so multiple location. Right. She's the Chief Operating Officer, um, and as an optometrist, she dedicates her practice to comprehensive eye care for the whole family, including the evaluation and treatment of dry eye, diabetic eye disease, corneal diseases and irregularities, and has a special interest in hard-to-fit contact lenses. Um, and so her practice, if you've ever seen it, and I'm putting up pictures so everyone can see it, is multi-location with ophthalmologists and optometrists working together hand in hand. So this is going to be a really interesting talk because we have two practitioners who practice in very different settings, both uh, doing a lot of co-management. So Ben, Katie, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, so as you mentioned, um, we are multi-specialty practice um, with several locations. There's five surgeons, um, one being in the glaucoma surgery realm, two cornea specialists, and um, a retina specialist as well, along with general ophthalmology, and then six optometrists in our office that all kind of pair up with these um, subspecialty specialty areas and help focus on their certain patient cares, um, handling in-office co-management of surgical patients, as well as facilitating um, the patients leaving the practice to go back to their um, regularly co-managed optometrists in the area. And so we stay busy with our largest um, majority of surgeries being cataract surgery and LASIK surgery, and we co-manage both of those mm. surgeries with our outside referring doctors. Right. And so, Ben, can you tell us a little bit about your practice and how it runs? Yes, absolutely. So I actually am the second generation uh, doctor here at Asman Eye Care. Uh, the practice was started in late 1970s by my father, Dr. Tom Asman, and then soon after that was joined by my uncle, Dr. Erwin Asman, and we um, run a very um, personalized practice, giving the highest level of care to all our patients. We do offer general eye care to all our patients, but we do um, focus on some of our specialties, which include contact lenses for keratoconus, difficult fits, um, as well as low vision and dry eye treatment. Um, the practice consists, as of today, of three uh, optometrists. Uh, we do have lots of relationships with local ophthalmologists, and we've actually um, started and collaborated with some ophthalmologists to create the Keratoconus Institute of Maryland, 
which um, in our mind is not the typical co-management, but it's a really sim- similar to a partnership where we're helping patients get care uh, for the entire spectrum of our keratoconus um, care and treatment. Right. And so that, that sounds like it's a little bit different, as you mentioned, in terms of, of co-management. So um, when you've been doing it this way. What have been sort of the benefits to your practice of that kind of a co-management model? Sure. I mean, I think the, the most important thing with co-managing patients, whether we're talking about the conventional you know, co-management for a surgical procedure or whatever the relationship is, the most important thing is that you're giving your patients the opportunity to get the best care. We've you know, partnered, we've established these relationships with doctors that we know and we trust. Uh, we're allowing the patient to, hey, you know, have procedures done, um, evaluations done, or giving them more access to care that's beyond our scope. And we have this relationship where once that, you know, referral is finished, the ophthalmologist or whoever it is will say, you need to see, you know, your referring doctor back. So I think the, 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 the best benefit is really for the patient um, at this point. Um, they get to see um, both doctors and have a you know, great mutual relationship with both of us. Right. And Katie, you know, you work directly with ophthalmologists in your practice. How, what does co-management look like for you? So co-management um, for us more directly in the sense of the word is co-managing a lot of our patients through um, actual insurance. So Medicare co-management for cataract surgery that during that 90-day um, global period that we have here in the, you know, in the state of Ohio that we are able to um, transfer care of the patient during their post-operative period to back to their referring doctor. And we look at it that way as, you know, that's their primary eye care practitioner and we're offering that patient a, a service, um, which is their surgery, but then we're promptly getting them back to their regular doctor who knows them well and will continue to take care of them for the, you know, the rest of their life. Um, using the term referring doctors, then like, you know, Ben's model, we also do that where we offer some, you know, consultation services in our other subspecialties. If they um, feel like the glaucoma in the primary care setting is um, becoming more severe and they need some intervention or some technology that's not offered in a primary care setting, they can send their patient to us on a referral basis where we will make sure that um, we're managing what they're referred for and getting the patient back to their regular doctor for all other care, including, you know, glasses, contacts, and general health of the eyes. So we have two types of models running in our practice, both co-managing and referring. Right, right. So why, why would you recommend this model to other practices? I would recommend it to other practices because it allows you to offer you know, the next level of care that you might not be able to provide in your own clinic, but still knowing the way that we have things set up that, you know, we will be getting that patient back to you. So as Ben had mentioned, it's just in the best interest of the patient to offer them that full access and spectrum of care that they might need. And that might involve several different doctors, but you know, you have doctors that are specifically focused on that patient's Mm -hmm. condition. Right. And uh, Katie, you mentioned, you know, that the patient will go out to other doctors and then come back to you. I know that for some doctors, there's anxiety, right, about working with with other professionals and sending the patient out worrying that they might not return. What do you do in your office to try to make sure that doesn't happen? You know, I'm glad you asked that because that's our number one um, focus when patients are coming in referred or co-managed with other doctors is making sure that they do not stay in our practice, that they're going back out when they're ready and medically stable. And what that looks like for us is um, first, when the patient registers in our practice management system, we have a block that very clearly states um, that they are someone else's patient. So the doctor's name is input there. Then when their chart is physically open in our electronic health records, the screen turns neon yellow. It is the neon yellow you can see on a, you know, a construction worker two miles away. So it's bright yellow screen so that all of our staff and doctors know that this is Dr. You know, X, Y, and Z's patient and not a patient of Northeast Ohio Eye Surgeons. Right. This will also flag us so that we don't release a spectacle RX to those patients, a contact lens RX to those patients. These patients are here for our specialty service and then they will leave the practice. We also, at the close of every exam, there's an automatic letter that's sent out at every single visit to their co-managing or referring doctor so that there is constant communication with that network. 
Right. Uh, ben, uh, how, how do you manage that? Uh, well, first I want to congratulate Dr. Greiner, and it sounds like your practice does have the right protocols, and I, I think that's phenomenal. We do have similar protocols where we do notate in our charts that this patient was by was referred by a specific doctor. We do take the extra steps and caution to do the same thing as well, not to prescribe or sell mini glasses or contact lenses. And I think what's key here, and you know, our practice may be a little bit smaller than Dr. Griner's, but what's key here is really communicating with those either co-managing mm-hmm. or, or referring doctors and building the rapport and their trust where they are comfortable sending their patients to our office for a particular you know, evaluation or procedure, and they know that we will send them back. When you have that trust, you know, you build on it for years and years, it becomes a lot more seamless and less things, you know, occur. Now, granted, when you're running a big cra- practice, things can fall through the cracks, um, so we're constantly reviewing things and looking to, you know, make better protocols in place. But it is a little bit of a delicate topic, um, as everyone had mentioned, and I I do hope that in the future, you know, optometrists can refer more to optometrists for specialties that they're not involved in, as well as ophthalmologists. We know we're here as eye care practitioners. We're all part of the same team. We're trying to help these patients. I think there is room for improvement um, you know, in, in this area. Absolutely. And, and Katie, I know you mentioned, you know, you send out a report always, right, to back to the referring physician. Do those reports change based, based on the kind of specialist that you're sending the information back to, or do you sort of have a standardized report that everyone gets? We have a standardized report that will walk through the pertinent parts of the exam, you know, including visual acuities and, um, you know, anterior and posterior segment findings based on the type of visit. But then there's a personalized section for each doctor where they have their assessment and plan and they have the ability to write a personal note. And a lot of our doctors will take advantage of that. Um, so they'll customize that to the doctor that they know has sent the patient in so they can relate to them one-on-one. And I think that's a nice added touch that, um, we've added over the years. And as Ben said, this is always a work in progress and you can't think for one day that you have it perfectly. You have to keep watching it. And as your practice grows, um, you know, it can get trickier, but you know, it, as you develop yourself in the community and, and our practice has been in business for 35 years now, people start to realize that strong relationship and that, that our whole goal is to, you know, have the patients come in for what they need and have them go right back out to their primary provider of eye care. Right. In fact, I, I was talking to another OD recently who had OCT angiography unit in their office, and they were starting to get referrals from, you know, both primary care and, and endocrinologists, right? right? And I think they were using their reports almost as a marketing tool um, to show what it is that mm-hmm. they do and what they know to the doctors out in the community who may not appreciate, you know, w- the scope of their practice. Right. And that's a good topic to discuss because we, you know, besides primary eye care providers, we do, since we have a retina specialist, we work really closely with endocrinology and um, we have a lot of rheumatologists that will send for dry eye and uveitis concerns and, and you know, family doctors sending for a, a little bit of everything. And you develop that strong relationship and you're also getting those letters back to those um, providers so that they know we're providing that level of care that they're looking for for their patients. How do you establish a relationship with these the doctors? The, the million dollar question, right? How do you actually get things started? <laughs> All right, I was I was going to say I I think you know if we recognize the value in establishing the, these relationships uh, for our patients and for our own practices as well, we really need to take the time. And I personally have gone out to visit these doctors, you know, to communicate them face to face, learn who they are, let them learn. Well, what our practice is all about, show that we're committed to our patients. You know, I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, I'm very involved in fitting patients um, for lenses for keratoconus. Um, I enjoy every patient encounter. When I sit down with some of these ophthalmologists and tell them if you know, a few stories, a few case studies, you know, they see that we're serious about this. They see what we're able to do. And I believe taking the time to meet them one-on-one is probably the best thing you can do to establish these relationships. You know, sending out, you know, generic letters to doctors is probably not going to, you know, land you referrals. It's really taking the time, take, making the efforts, and going out, meeting one-on-one, 
perhaps calling them, you know, exchanging emails or, 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 or you know, phone numbers to text message them, whatever it is to really um, become their friends and realize that it's a win-win situation for the patient. And I, I couldn't agree more with what Ben says, uh, making that personal connection. And anytime we hire a new doctor into the practice, um, we spend several days taking them kind of on tour of Northeast Ohio and, and meeting doctors that we've established relationships or also introducing them to doctors that also might be new in the area so that they have that kind of initial connection of saying, you know, I'm handling all these diabetic patients at this PCP office and I don't know where to send them. And now we've got a new doctor that's ready and willing to take on those patients. Um, we all share our personal emails and cell phone numbers and encourage the doctors in the community to text or call us even on the weekends. Um, we have 24 seven call in our office and we tell them, um, you know, we will happily, um, you know, handle emergencies that, you know, you've seen in the office and are outside of um, your comfort level. We can bring them into our office and take care of them. And then um, we've been lucky enough to have one of our staff members um, be more of a liaison to us, um, to the doc from us as the doctors to the outside doctors. Since, you know, we're in clinic 40 hours a week and we can't always handle those as, as quickly as um, as quickly as we want to get back to those doctors, she can kind of triage um, what's going on out there and what needs done and get their patient in, uh, in a very timely manner or answer a question they might have on co-managing, et cetera. So it's been nice to have that liaison. And she'll also um, go out several times a week to doctor's offices and drop off information from our office to let them know that we're here and give them business cards and let them know, um, you know, if we have something new going on in the office, if we're doing a new surgery or something like that. So she's a patient um, and a doctor advocate and educator for us. Right. right. And, you know, you, you mentioned something funny, the, the C words, right? Cell phones. Um, did you actually give yeah. out your cell phone number? I know a lot of docs are nervous. We about, do. Yeah, a lot of docs are nervous about doing it, but you have a very busy practice. How often do people actually call you? <laughs> You know, email and text make it much easier these days. So that's kind of nice that, um, you know, I could answer them at midnight if I've had a long day and I finally get quiet time at that hour and I can email or, or text them back instead of, you know, having to, you know, interrupt the day with a, a phone call. But we don't mind that. I don't think we get um, abused by it whatsoever. I think people are very respectful. But if they have a concern or a question, we just want them to know that we're available and with 11 of us in the practice, I, I think we kind of all have our certain relationships that have been established so that we kind of share the love. And and uh, I, I will tell you honestly, I don't think it's ever felt like it's been abused. Ben, do you do something similar? Do you, do you give out your, your information like that? Well, are you referring to, to other doctors or to patients? To doctors. Doctor, yeah, absolutely. I do give up my cell phone, um, email. Um, I find it very beneficial having, you know, um, let's say, for example, my retinal specialist who I refer to. I have a couple of them. Their their texts. Uh, we we chat through text. If I have a quick question or if I need to get a patient in right away, um, I feel very comfortable texting them, um, and they don't have a problem, you know, texting me back. So I think it's, um, you know, something that I don't mind doing, and I think it's very beneficial. Um, some doctors will text me as well if they're referring a patient for, let's say, keratoconus evaluation. I think we're living in a time where, you know, people are starting to just, this is the, the, the new telephone. You know, people are communicating so much more via text and email. It's almost becoming the standard where, you know, why would I withhold my cell phone number to a referring doctor that I work with if it, it could make things, you know, more seamless and smooth? And I think if you want to develop a strong co-management or referral model, you have to be open to that. You have to have that availability and um, that open communication because that's how the model works. Right. So being available is, is absolutely critical and, and really sharing that with the other doctors, letting them know that you're there for them. Um, you know, having that open communication because let's say we're getting referrals from some certain doctors who don't handle certain these cases they may be uncomfortable with something that's going on. They want to have someone to turn to right. and say, hey, you know, Dr. Griner or hey, Dr. Asman, I have this case. Um, I'm not sure. I'm a little uncomfortable. Can you, you know, get in touch with this patient or can you have your office call? They want to feel that, you know, you're working with them, like, you know, and whenever they're in need, you're there for them. And that will actually bolster the relationship uh, tremendously.
Absolutely. Good. And just, just to reassure everyone, you know, with CEYR, I've given out my phone number now to over 9,000 optometrists. They, everybody's got my cell phone number. <laughs> and it's only, I, literally, I will maybe get a call once a week. That's it. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Most people are very respectful of your time, I think. The proof is in the pudding. Yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, this has been really fun. So, do you guys have any, anything, any sort of final notes for us about co management and what advice you'd give to really get people started with it? I just think. Um, in our world, like Ben mentioned, you know, it, it would, it's great to see more optometrists referring to optometrists. You know, optometrists uh, initially seem like they're jack of all trades and we, you know, we dabble um, in a lot of different areas, but we're seeing the world of medicine become so much more focused. And if there's an area of focus that you don't feel comfortable in, um, there's no reason that you can't send it to somebody else that does and then have that patient, you know, come back to you. It's not giving up your patient or not feeling like you're confident enough to handle it. It's just knowing that that's outside your, your wheelhouse and you could do better service for that patient by them going somewhere else, knowing that you have that relationship with the doctor that they'll get them back to you. So I think it's just overcoming that, that um, feeling of I, I have to hold on to my patient for everything that they need. Yeah, I couldn't have said any better. I share the same sentiment with with, uh, Dr. Greiner. I do want to see in the future, and I'm really hopeful that there will be more collaboration between optometrists to optometrists. Again, the model of optometry to ophthalmology has improved over the years, so I'm hopeful that we'll see this improve also. And I think what every optometrist um, or every ophthalmologist needs to do is ask themselves the following question. What is the best for this patient? And if you ask that simple question day in, day out, if you're serious about what you do and you're passionate about giving the patient the best care, then they will make that referral. Um, again, so I am very hopeful, um, optimistic about you know the future, and hopefully we'll see. Uh, we'll look back 20 years from you know, from this phone call interview, and we'll see. Hey, you know we've, we've seen a major improvement in this area. Right. We can only hope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Ben, Ben, Katie, thanks so much for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Um, It was enjoyable and uh, hopefully it was helpful for everyone.